verses 10 through 13. The word says, Who will bring me to the fortified city? Who will lead me to Edom? Is it not you, O God, you who have rejected us and no longer goes out with our armies? Give us aid against the enemy, for the help of man is worthless. With God, we will gain the victory, and he will trample down our enemies. Amen. And the Lord have blessing to the reading of his holy word. Brothers and sisters and friends and neighbors, we gather today to worship God, to give him glory and honor. He is holy and righteous, and there's no sin that can go into his presence. Would you pray a, fear, uh, a, a sincere prayer of repentance with me? Would you pray for the Lord to forgive us and have mercy on us? And pray for each other and pray for this service. Pray that the Lord, His Holy Spirit, would lead us and guide us. Would you go with me now to the Lord? Would you open your heart and your mind to God? Let us pray together in the name of Jesus. Mighty God, Father in heaven, we humble ourselves before you. We know that you are God Almighty, creator of the heavens and the earth, and there is no other. Yes, you are the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yes, you are the three in one, and you are our God. You are holy and righteous, and Lord, we are sinners. We have rebelled. We have failed you, Lord. We need your mercy. We need your grace. We need you to forgive us, Lord, and to cover us with the blood of Jesus. For we believe in Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah, the Holy One of God. And we believe in Him and we accept Him. May your Spirit lead us and guide us, Lord. Be with us, Lord, for your glory, for your joy, Lord. Let us worship you. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, thank you. Thank you for every soul, every family, Lord, represented, Lord, by these people and the people who hear this service, Lord. Be with each and every one of them. We know we're sinners. We know we're unworthy, Lord. But you paid the price, Lord. You did it for us. Only you could do that. And you have saved us and you have called us. And we pray, Lord, that you'd give us strength for we are weak. That you would cover us with your blood. That you would accept us, Lord, as your people. That we would draw near to you and be pleasing to you. Help us, Lord, to put away the world. Not to worry about yesterday or today or tomorrow. But to give this time to you. Oh, Lord, we need your strength your guidance and your power. Have mercy on us. Have mercy. For it's in Jesus' precious name we do pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Heart 10,000 harps and voices. Heart 10,000 harps and voices. Sounds a note of praise above. A king of praise and heaven rejoices. Jesus reigns, the God of love. A sea he sits on yonder throne. A Jesus rules the world of all. Hallelujah, 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 amen. A king of glory reigns forever, a thine an everlasting crown. A not a from thy love shall sever, for those whom thou hast made thy own. At the object of thy grace, a destined to behold thy face. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. A Savior hastens thine appearing. Bring, oh, bring the glorious day. Oh, when the awful summons hear it, heaven and earth shall pass away. And then with golden hearts we'll see. Glory, glory to the King. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Amen. 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 From the rising of the sun. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the saints of the Lord's name is to be praised. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the saints of the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah, praise ye the Lord. Praise Him, all ye servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. From this time forth, Sun. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same to the Lord's name is to be praised. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same to the Lord's name. Hallelujah, praise ye the Lord. Praise Him, all ye servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. From this time forth, please stand with me and let's go to the Lord. I ask that you just repeat after me, please. Jesus is Lord. The Lord is good. Praise the Lord. Jesus is Lord. The Lord is good. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen, and be seated, please. And as you're taking your seat, turn with me to the book of Amos, Amos chapter 6. We're going to be looking at verses 8 through 14 this morning. That's Amos 6, verses 8 through 14. Sister Wazel will read for us in the Korean language. Sister Wazel, please. 하나님께서 주신 오늘의 말씀입니다. 아모서 6장 8절에서 14절입니다. 만군의 하나님 여호와의 말씀이니라 주 여호와가 당신을 두고 맹세하셨노라 내가 야곱의 영광을 싫어하며 그 궁궐들을 미워하므로 이 성원과 거기에 가득한 것을 원수에게 넘기리라 하셨느니라 한 집에 열 사람이 낳는다 하여도 다 죽을 것이라 죽은 사람의 친척고 그 시체를 불사를 자가 그 뼈를 집 밖으로 가져갈 때에 그집 그집 기숙한 곳에 있는 자에게 묻기를 아직 더 있느냐 하며 대답하기를 없다 하리니 그가 또 말하기를 잔삼하라 우리가 여호와의 이름을 부르지 못할 것이라 하리라 보라 여호와께서 명령하심으로 타격을 받아 큰 집을 갈라지고 작은 집은 터지 터지리라 말들이 어찌 바위에 달리겠으며 소가 어찌 거기서 박갈겠느냐 그런데 너의 정리를 슬개로 바꾸며 공의의 열매를 쓴 쑥으로 바꾸며 허무한 것을 기뻐하며 이러기를 우리는 우리의 힘으로 뿔들을 취하지 아니하였느니라 하는도다 만군의 하나님 여호와의 말씀이니라 이스라엘 족속아 내가 한 나라를 일으켜 너희를 치리니 그들이 하마 어기에서부터 아라바 시내까지 너를 학대하리라 하셨느니라. Amen. Amos. Chapter 6, verses 8 through 14. The Sovereign Lord has sworn by Himself 
the Lord God Almighty declares, I abhor the pride of Jacob and detest his fortresses. I will deliver up the city and everything in it. If ten men are left in one house, they too will die. And if a relative who is to burn the bodies comes to carry them out of the house and ask anyone still hiding there, is anyone with you? And he says no, then he will say, hush. We must not mention the name of the Lord. For the Lord has given the command, and he will smash the great house into pieces and the small houses into bits. The horses run on the rocky crags. Does one plow there with oxen? But you have turned justice into poison and the fruit of righteousness into bitterness. You who rejoice in the conquest of Lobar, Lodibar and say, Did we not take our name by our own strength? For the Lord God Almighty declares, I will stir, stir up a nation against you, O house of Israel, that will oppress you all the way from Lebo Hamath to the valley of the Arabah. Amen. May the Lord have blessed to read of his holy word. Let us pray, please. Our Father in heaven, mighty God, thank you, Lord, for this, your holy word, and thank you for this message, and thank you for these who hear this message, Lord. I ask, Lord, that you would give us your Holy Spirit to open our eyes and open our ears, that we may get what you would have us, Lord, to get from you today, and that, Lord, what we do, what is said here, is, Lord, in your perfect and good will and pleasing to you. Help us to draw near to you through this message. Help us, Lord, to be what you would have us to be. For it is in your name, Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. This morning I want to speak to you about our pride. In verses 1 through 7 of this chapter, uh, you may remember I preached about that last time, God pronounces woe on Israel. He said in verse 1, Woe to you who are complacent in Zion. In today's scripture, he continues that pronouncement of woe. And as we know, woe is a statement of grief and anguish and mourning. God is grieved. He's not happy about what he has to do. Because God is who he says he is. He is God Almighty. He is grieved and he's mourning over the fact that he's going to have to judge. He's going to have to judge his people, his chosen people. And he's not doing this because he wants to, because it makes him happy. He's doing it because he is God. And he hates to do it, but he has to do it. You see, he has to judge them because they are complacent in their relationship with him, in their relationship with God. They're comfortable. They're laid back. They're not looking to God. They're not looking to him at all. They're too comfortable. In fact, they're fine with the way things are. They think, oh, well, we're good. Everything's fine. I'm doing enough. I'm doing more than I should, maybe. Everything's good. They only look to God for what he can do for them. They only want God to make them more comfortable. After all, they're God's children, right? They're God's people. Aren't they God's people? Yes, they are. They are God's people. But look at what he told them in verse 8. The Sovereign Lord has sworn by himself. The Lord God Almighty declares, I abhor the pride of Jacob and detest his fortresses. I will deliver up the city and everything in it. God swore by who he is. He means that despite Jacob's seed being his chosen people, despite the fact that they are Abraham's children. He hated what they had become. In this prophetic message, God tells Israel 
that it doesn't matter about their status, that despite their status as God's chosen people, he was going to deliver them into the hands of their enemies. It didn't matter. Even though they were God's chosen, even though God loved them, he was going to give them up because he had to. And then he goes on to outline the, the affliction that he's going to bring on them as a result. We need to see this today. We need to see it and we need to understand it. Like he did with Israel, God is still in the business of afflicting those who are complacent. God has to shake us up sometimes with a, a righteous affliction, if you will. To put it sort of in today's language, sometimes God has to rock our world or rock our boat to what? To wake us up. Because we get so comfortable with the way things are. We're, we're so happy with the way things are and the way we feel and we just get so comfortable we forget God. We don't call on God. You see, each of us needs to wake up from our complacency in Zion. Hopefully, we will wake up before God has to wake us up. If we wake up, then praise the Lord, he doesn't have to wake us up. But if God has to wake us up, oh, we're not going to like that. You see, he shakes us up with his righteous affliction. Now, let's consider our scripture and let's consider his righteous afflictions that God brings on his complacent people so that maybe we can see how God operates and how he may deal with us if we're not careful. First, he afflicts their bodies. Look with me again at verses 9 through 10 and follow along as I read them again, please. Verses 9 through 10, follow along. It says, If ten men are left in one house, they too will die. And if a relative who is to burn the bodies comes to carry them out of the house and ask anyone still hiding there, is anyone with you? And he says, no. Then he will say, hush. We must not mention the name of the Lord. Now, with, I want you to look at this for a second with me. One type of affliction that God brings on us is he afflicts our bodies. God can and he does afflict the bodies of his complacent people. The picture here in our text brings to mind to me some of the great plagues of the past, like the Black Plague in the 14th century or different bubonic plagues that have happened around the world. We don't really use the word plague anymore, do we? We don't really use that word. No, it's not nearly scientific enough. It doesn't sound good enough for us. Instead, we use the word pandemic instead of plague. And things like the bird flu and, and other types of flu and, of course, COVID that we've just gone through. These words scare many people. But they're nowhere near the level of destruction, God said, that he would bring on Israel. He would afflict them with it. Now, don't get me wrong. God doesn't have to bring it. In fact, he doesn't. He just allows it to happen. Brothers and sisters, as I've often told you, and it's very evident, we live in a world, and this world is full of evil, it's full of bad things. And these bad things can hurt us, and many times they do. Without God's protection, we would have been destroyed many, many years ago. There would be no human race. But God has protected us and is protecting us. All he has to do, though, is allow things to come at us that authority there and without protecting us. Remember, creation has been going bad ever since the fall of mankind. Before there was sin in the world, there was peace and happiness and joy. The Garden of Eden, we can't even experience it. We don't even know what it's like. It's so good. But ever since that, the world and creation has been going worse. 
But all the time, even with that happening, God is still in control. Yes, there's evil. Yes, there's hurt. Yes, there's pain. Yes, there's losses. But listen, God is a righteous God, and he will take care of his own, and he's still in control. Why? Why does he allow these things to happen? Because he uses things of this earth for his purposes. We may not understand his purposes all the time. We may not understand it, may not accept it, and even get angry. But still, God is in control. In this case here, God is using pestilence on Israel to wake them up. He was using it sort of to spank them, you know. If you think about spanking, you know, he was letting that happen. God told Israel that he was going to afflict their bodies. He was going to afflict their bodies so that they would wake up. Because if they didn't wake up and begin to truly serve God, he would eventually have to judge them. As bad as I hate being afflicted by God, I'd rather be afflicted than to be judged. Affliction only lasts a little while. Judgment lasts forever. And in the big scheme of things, God's affliction is easy compared to his judgment. God pictures groups of people quarantining themselves together in this building. You see the ten men are in one house. They're quarantining themselves together in a building. But then one by one, they all wind up dying too. But people are so scared of the pestilence, so scared of the disease that they're even unwilling to, to deal properly with the dead. They're afraid to go get the bodies. And this is common when the plagues are throughout history. If you notice, they burn whole buildings. Whole buildings are burned in order to keep from having to come in contact with the contamination of the dead. They burn buildings. They burn houses. What is Israel's attitude toward God in this whole thing? They say, don't mention his name. Don't mention the name of God. Now that sounds strange to us, doesn't it? Doesn't that sound strange to us? Why, why would they say that? Why would they say, don't mention God's name? You see, from our perspective, if God was to bring a pandemic on us, who would we look to to fix it? If God allowed a pandemic to come, who do we go to to fix it? <laughs> I can tell you. It's pretty obvious. The government or science. How many people went to God over COVID? Did we not go to the government to fix it? Did the government not make us live the way we have for the past two years? Were we not directed and ruled and told what to do and how to live and how to wear masks and where to go where we couldn't go? Were we not told by the government and science? That's very true in today's society. Maybe the question we should be asking is this. What is God, what is God trying to tell us? He's afflicted us. Why? Why is what he's trying to tell us? Why is he letting this happen to us? Remember, God is in control. We've already established that, right? God's in control. If he's in control and he's allowing this to happen, why? That's what we should be asking. That's who we should go to. Not the government. Not science. True science is from God anyway. Maybe the question we ought to is, what is God trying to teach us? Remember, he's in control, and Israel didn't do that. They didn't do that. They said, 
Hold your tongue. Don't bring God's name into this. Don't call out to God. Just be quiet. Don't ask him what's going on. Don't look to him for in humble repentance. Just burn your dead and move on. Live your life. That's what they did. God afflicted the bodies of his complacent people to try to wake them up. But they didn't wake up. They just kept sleeping. They slept on. Then God afflicted buildings. Look at verse 11 and follow along as I read verse 11. Follow along. For the Lord has given the command, and he will smash the great house into pieces and the small house into bits. Now, what's that all about? Well, let's think about this. God can afflict the buildings of his complacent people. How much value do you place in the buildings around you? Will ever think about this? Think about this for a second. How much time do you spend inside versus outside? How much time do you spend inside as opposed to outside? Actually, buildings are very important to us. Where do we spend most of our time in a 24-hour day? Think about that. Are we inside or outside? Even those of you who think of yourself as nature-loving people who love the outdoors, who love the outside, you spend more time inside than you do outside, I bet you. Every single one of us do. How many of y'all sleep in your yards at night? Not many, right? We don't want the dew on us, cold. We Buildings are important to us. Not only do we use buildings for basic shelter, though, we use them for all kinds of things. Many times they actually re represent more than they do. Our houses represent uh, to many to us uh, whether we're successful or not. And if you don't believe me that a, a, a lot of uh, importance and value is placed on buildings, think about back in the World Trade Center. When the World Trade Centers was destroyed. In the big scheme of things, God's calling somebody. I hit it. God's using KCAL. Wow. In the big scheme of things, only two buildings were destroyed. Out of how many buildings are in New York City? Anybody have any idea how many buildings are there? I don't know, but it's an awful lot. Only two were destroyed. Now, I hate it that people died, but only two buildings were destroyed, and the sight of those two buildings crashing to the ground moved a nation, a whole nation, because of two buildings. But what but moved, it moved the nation to do what? Did it wake us up to the sinfulness? and the fall on its face and, and God's repent and to God in repentance? Did we fall on our faces before God and repent? Or did we stand up in the comfort and complacency of our own strength and, and pride and our own self sufficiency? Did we say, Oh, we can destroy them with those who are trying to hurt us, we can kill them. What do you think God's desire was in the destruction of those two buildings? He let it happen. He could have stopped it. What did we as a nation do? I know that God told Israel that he was going to smite all their buildings, whether great or small, he was, he was going to bring affliction on them. In other words, he was going to try to wake them up by smashing their buildings to bits and pieces. God afflicted the buildings of his complacent people to wake them up. He afflicted their bodies and their buildings. But they didn't listen. 
they still did not listen to God. So then he afflicted their blank brains. Look at verses 12 through 13 and follow along with me as I read them. Verses 12 and 13. Do horses run on the rocky crags? Does one plow there with oxen? But you have turned justice into poison and the fruit of righteousness into bitterness. You who rejoice in the conquest of Lodibar and say, Did we not take Karnaim by our own strength? God can and he will afflict the brains of his complacent people. I don't think there's any arguing the fact that today, mankind, we here, we're, we're more technologically advanced in America than we've ever, ever been. The average person with the internet, uh, just a basic internet connection, has access to more information than anyone has ever, ever had before in history. You can find the answer to just about any question you have. In fact, you can find a bunch of answers. A bunch of them will be wrong, but there's going to be some that's right, and you have to be very careful. But the information is there. But where, where has all that education, all that knowledge, where has it gotten us? What good has it done us? Has it made us closer to God or farther away from God? That's the question. Think about it for a second. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that education and knowledge is a bad thing because it's not bad. It's not. In fact, it can be a wonderful gift from God. What I'm saying is this. It doesn't matter how educated you are. It doesn't matter how much knowledge you have access to. It doesn't matter. Complacent people, even with knowledge, are still complacent. Toward God. It doesn't matter if they have doctor's degree. It doesn't matter if they have all the PhDs in the world. It doesn't matter if they're not close to God. If they're not worshiping God, they are just worse not doing what they should do. They're complacent. And if the education and the knowledge leads to self-reliance, in other words, self-sufficiency and pride, God will certainly afflict it. If I think I'm too smart for God, if I think I don't understand God, therefore God is not God, if I think that I can do it on my own, then God can smite my brain. Afflict me. He will muddle even the most basic knowledge. Look at what he said he would do to Israel. It's pretty evident in the questions that he asked them. Who in the world would run a horse on rocky ground, this rocky crag? If you ran a horse, I'm not even a horseman, not very much, no. Don't have a lot of experience. But I know on rocky crags, you don't run your horse. Because if you run your horse, then guess what? Your horse might as well be glued because you're going to break his legs and tear him up and kill him. He will be worthless. You can't run horses on rocky crags. And who would even attempt to plow that kind of ground with a team of oxen? That's the question he asked. The only thing you would wind up is with lame oxen and a broken plow. Who would do that? You see in order to attempt to wake them up from their complacency, God afflicts their brains. He afflicted them to the point that the things they thought were just was really like poison. God afflicted their brains to the point that things that they thought were righteous was really bitter and toxic. To paraphrase, I like to paraphrase what verse 13 God says, you're rejoicing 
in nothing. So why does he say that? Because they see their strength as something they have developed for themselves. Out of their own wisdom and their own knowledge, they believe they have built their strength. But God does not see it that way. Do you think God views all our technology and our knowledge and military understanding that we have today the same way? Because God calls it nothing. The truth is, the more knowledge we try to gain apart from God, the truth is, really the less we know. We may learn everything that the world has for us, we may learn so many, so many theories. And that's exactly what they are, theories. Because our limited knowledge, our knowledge is limited. And if any time we think we know more than God, we are really in trouble. And he muddles our minds, our brains. God calls it nothing. The Bible says that the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. When we grow complacent, our knowledge, God can afflict it. God afflicted the brains of his complacent people to try to make them wake up. He afflicted their bodies, their buildings, and then their brains, but they still, they still didn't listen. They didn't wake up. So then, he afflicted their relationships. Look at verse 14. Follow along as I read it again, please. Verse 14, follow along. For the Lord God Almighty declared, I will stir up a nation against you, O house of Israel, that will oppress you all the way from Lebo Hamath to the valley of the Arabah. God can afflict the relationships, the treaties, if you will, of God's complacent people. Remember back to what we talked about last week when I preached about Israel's situation at this point in history. They are very militarily secure. In fact, uh, the nations around them, they're more, uh, since they're more secure than they were since the days of Solomon. All the nations around them were significantly weaker than they were. They were pretty strong, and they were doing well economically, including their weak little neighbor, this little nation called Assyria. At that time, Assyria was pretty weak. But within 30 years, that weak little declining neighbor would completely overrun the borders of mighty, strong Israel. They would lay siege to the cities and destroy the military and the strongholds. And Assyria would actually lead the people away in bondage with hooks in their noses and their lips tied to ropes. And they would conquer Israel from the northernmost point of Hemoth to the southernmost point of the Arabah. So how could Assyria be able to do that? They were a little bitty nation. At that time, they, they had no strength. Let me tell you why. Pretty obvious. Because God raised them up for that purpose. He raised them up to afflict the nation of Israel. God afflicted Israel's borders to the point that their complete national identity was no longer available. It was carted off, carried off into Assyria. And after the final exile in 722 B.C., Israel's territory really bore no resemblance at all to the land of God's people because they had been carted off. It looked like the rest of the pagan world was no longer the land of milk and honey. It was no longer the land of God's people. Israel survived only as a remnant of people preserved by God in a foreign land. 
You know, today, there's a lot of political talk about securing our borders in America. Anybody heard any of that, anything about that on the news? Seems like every week at least, there's at least one story in the news about securing our borders. Uh, but do you honestly think that if we built a fence or a wall, or let's say a hundred foot tall, <laughs> you think it's going to protect us if God affliction it? If God doesn't want us protected, I don't care how big the wall is. If God's not protecting us, now don't get me wrong, I'm not talking politics here, okay? I'm not talking politics. I'm just talking the truth. If we put a wall up that's a hundred feet high, and God is not protecting us, do you think we're protected? I don't think so. I don't think so at all. Do you think that a few more border uh, patrolmen, more border guards, and maybe some drones, and maybe put some soldiers down on the border, do you think if God's not protecting us, that will protect us? No. If God is afflicting our American borders, no amount of effort on our part will stop our enemies. I don't care what we have. If God allows the enemy to come against us, we, in our strength, will not be able to stop. God desired here to wake up Israel by afflicting their borders and relationships with other countries. He afflicted their bodies, he afflicted their buildings, their brains, their treaties, and now their borders with other nations. But they still would not listen. None of God's righteous afflictions woke them up. No matter even with all this, they were still complacent. They still weren't listening to God. So in conclusion, I want us to think about a few things. Actually, God can afflict anything if we depend on that other than depending on God, God can afflict it. Anything you put before God, he can afflict it. We can see what God's righteous affliction looked like for Israel, and that's what it's looking like in America. But what could it look like here in our church. Let's, let's get closer to home. We see what's happening in the nation around us. We, we see what's happening in the world around us. What's happening in our church? Could God afflict our church body, our church people? Could he afflict us with pestilence and disease? That is, that right there is physical affliction. I think it's more than likely that God would really afflict us spiritually more than physically. Do you not agree? If God's going to afflict us, his people, who are spiritual people, we are spiritually his people, would he not afflict us spiritually? Do we quarantine ourselves from serving God? Do we quarantine ourselves from reaching the world and do we just stay and wait and say, wait till we die, I'm saved, I'm good, let's not worry about other people? Is that what we do? Could God afflict our church building? Could God afflict our brains in our church? Could he make it so that we are unable to hear his word? And even if we hear his word, could he make it to where we couldn't understand his word? Or maybe we can't apply his word? Could God do that to us? Could he make it so that even the basic truth of Christianity 
have no meaning for us anymore. You know the basic truth. Truths like whoever is first will be last. Truths like they know you are Christian by your love for each other. Truths like submit to one another. Truths like you're not your own, but you were bought with a price. Could these most basic truths of the Christian faith be uncomprehensible to us? Do you know what that means? Do you know whoever is first is last? Do you know that they will know you as a Christian by your love? Do you know that you're supposed to submit to one another? Do you not know that you were bought with a price? Do you know that? Do you have it there? Or do you have it here? Many of you, your lives don't show that you have it here. Maybe we know them in our heads. But do we really know these truths in our hearts? If we are complacent, I don't see any reason why God couldn't or wouldn't afflict us in these same ways. You can blame him, you can get angry, you can do whatever you want, but God is still God and he's in control. Remember, though, that God loves us enough that he would rather afflict us than judge us. Because, you see, I don't know about you, I don't want to be afflicted, I don't want to be judged, I don't want either one. But we know that God's righteous affliction can look like because we can see it, and it isn't pretty, we see what happens. So how do we avoid his affliction? First, let's wake up. Let's wake up every single one of us and let's confess our sins, our past sins and our present sins. Let's confess to God. Just like our personal lives, we can say as a people, Lord, forgive us of our sins. I believe, based on God's word, that if what you say that, when you say, Lord, please forgive me, If you say it from your heart, God will hear you and he will forgive you. But it has to be from your heart. You just can't say it. Just saying the words doesn't mean anything. It's got to be real and from your heart. Then once you say that, then you repent of your sins. In other words, you turn from your sins. It's one thing to confess our sin, but it's a whole other thing to turn away from our sin in repentance. Obviously, I don't know about you, but I need God's grace, and I need his power to help me not do those things that are sin anymore. Because I can't stop in my strength. I can't stop in my power. I have to depend upon God. I need his grace. I need him. And by the guidance and the leadership of his spirit, we can be more successful in repenting and turning from our sins. We can't do it by ourselves. This message today is for the individuals and the whole church together. Is this church awake? Are we awake? Is our church awake or are we complacent? Do we really love each other? Do we really love God? Do we put him first? Or was I taking care of myself? I'm taking care of what I want, things I want to do. Or am I putting God first? Think about that. 
In fact, pray about that. Pray about your condition and your relationship with God before God. Talk to Him. He's the one that can fix it. You can't. You have to pray and ask for God to help you. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, our loving, kind, wonderful God Almighty, who we call Abba Father through your Son Jesus and what he has done for us, O oh Lord, have mercy on us and forgive us. For we are all complacent, Lord. We are all lazy. We have made us so comfortable, Lord. And your afflictions may come. And you have the right, Lord, because you are God Almighty. And you're in control. And Lord, if I need affliction, then Lord, let it come before judgment comes, Lord. And may we all have that kind of heart. May we all draw near to you. Oh, Lord, we need your forgiveness. We need your grace and your mercy so that we can have strength, Lord, as we repent of our sins, Lord, and we put them behind us, Lord, and we turn from our sins. May we turn to you, and may your Holy Spirit anoint us with power and strength, Lord, to say no to temptation, to say no to evil, Lord. And in Jesus' name, let us rejoice because we are closer to you. Thank you, Lord, for being the loving God that you are. And may, Lord, if anyone's here today and they need to make a decision, a decision, Lord, to draw nearer to you, then I pray, Lord, that you would help it, that you would help them, and that they would feel your conviction, and that they would feel your love, and that you would draw them to you. For it is in your name, Lord Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Let's all stay.